I had begun having nightmares about the reality of adult life as early as perhaps age seven. I knew, even then, that the dreams involved my father's life and job and the way he looked when he returned home from work at the end of the day. His arrival was always between 5.42 and 5.45, and it was usually I who was the first to see him come through the front door. What occurred was almost choreographic in its routine. He came in already turning in order to press the door closed behind him. He removed his hat and top coat and hung the coat in the foyer closet, clawed his necktie loose with two fingers, took the green rubber band off of the dispatch, entered the living room, greeted my brother, and sat down with the newspaper to wait for my mother to bring him a highball. The nightmares themselves always opened with a wide-angle view of a number of men at desks in rows in a large, brightly lit room or hall. The desks were arranged in precise rows and columns like the desks of an R.B. Hayes classroom, but these were all more like the large, gray, steel desks that the teachers had at the front of the room, and there were many, many more of them, perhaps a hundred or more, each occupied by a man in suit and tie. If there were windows, I do not remember noticing them. Some of the men were older than others, but they were all obviously adults, people who drove and applied for insurance coverage and had highballs while they read the paper before dinner. The nightmare's room was at least the size of a soccer or flag football field. It was utterly silent and had a large clock on each wall. It was also very bright. In the foyer, turning from the front door while his left hand rose to remove his hat, my father's eyes appeared lightless and dead, empty of everything we associated with his real personality. He was a kind, decent, ordinary-looking man. His voice was deeply pitched but not resonant. Soft-spoken, he had a sense of humor that kept his natural reserve from seeming remote or aloof. Even when my brother and I were small, we were aware that he spent more time with us and took the trouble to show us that we were important to him a good deal more than most fathers of that era did. It was many years before I had any real idea of how our mother felt about him. The foyer was directly off the living room where the piano was, and at that time I often read or played with my trucks outside of kicking range beneath the piano while my brother practiced his hannons, and I was often the first to register the sound of my father's key in the front door. It took only four steps and a brief sock slide into the foyer to be able to see him first as he entered on a wave of outside air. I remember the foyer as dim and cold and smelling of the coat closet, the bulk of which was filled with my mother's different coats and matching gloves. The front door was heavy and difficult to open and close, as if the foyer were somehow pressurized. The door had a small, diamond-shaped window in the center, though we later moved before I was ever tall enough to see out of it. He had to put his side into the door somewhat in order to make it close all the way, and I would not see his face until he turned to remove his hat and coat. But I can recall that the angle of his shoulders as he leaned into the door had the same quality as his eyes. I could not convey this quality now and most assuredly couldn't have then, but I know that it helped inform the nightmares. His face was not at all like this on weekends off. It is in hindsight that I believe the dreams to have been about adult life. At the time, I knew only their terror. Much of the difficulty they complained of in getting me to lie down and go to sleep at night was due to these dreams. Nor could it always have been dusk at 542, though that is what I recall its being, and the inrush of outside air he brought with him as cold, and scented with burnt leaves and the sad way the street smelled at twilight, when all of the houses became the same color and all of their porch lights came on like bulwarks against something without name. His eyes, when he turned from the door, didn't scare me, but the feeling was somehow related to being scared. Often I still had a truck in my hand. His hat went on the hat rack, his coat shouldered out of, then the coat was folded over his left arm, the closet opened with his right hand, the coat transferred to that hand while the third wooden coat hanger from the left is removed with his left hand. There was something about this routine that cast shadows down deep in parts of me I could not access on my own. I knew something of boredom by then, of course, at Hayes and Riverside, or on Sunday afternoons when there was nothing to do, 
the fidgety type of childhood boredom that is more like worry than despair. But I do not believe I consciously connected the way my father looked at night with the far different and deeper soul-level boredom of his job, which I knew was actuarial because in second grade everybody in Mrs. Claymore's ha homeroom had had to give a short presentation on what our father's profession was. I knew that insurance was protection that adults applied for in case of risk, and I knew that it had numbers in it because of the documents that were visible in his briefcase when I got to pop its latches and open it for him. And my brother and I had had the building that housed the insurance company's headquarters and my father's tiny window in its face pointed out to us by our mother from the car. But the actual specifics of his job were always vague. And they remained so for many years. Looking back, I suspect that there was something of a cover your eyes and stop your ears quality to my lack of curiosity about just what my father had to do all day. I can remember certain exciting narrative tableau based around the competitive, almost primitive connotations of the word breadwinner, which had been Mrs. Claymore's blanket term for our father's occupations. But I do not believe I knew or could even imagine, as a child, that for almost thirty years of fifty-one weeks a year, my father sat all day at a metal desk in a silent, fluorescent-lit room, reading forms and making calculations and filling out further forms on the results of those calculations, breaking only occasionally to answer his telephone or meet with other actuaries in other bright, quiet rooms. With only a small and sunless north window that looked out on other small office windows in other gray buildings. The nightmares were vivid and powerful, but they were not the kind from which you wake up crying out and then have to try to explain to your mother when she comes what the dream was about so that she could reassure you that there was nothing like what you just dreamed in the real world. 